I was in Paris under rather illegal circumstances. I, I uh, had driven in there. I, I had this Jeep, and I had driven into Paris, and I had just come up from Italy, and I was wearing the clothes I wore in Italy. Uh, a fur cap, which looked like a Russian cap. This uh, came from the 10th Mountain Division in Italy. Uh, I had a, an armored force combat jacket, you know those nice jackets with the knit collar and the knit sleeves. And uh, I had a pair of paratrooper pants and a pair of jump boots, <laughs> which I had gotten from the paratroopers for drawing cartoons about the wrong people wearing <laughs> paratrooper boots. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had learned to scrounge back in the 45th Division days. So anyway, uh, uh, needless to say, I was way out of uniform in Paris. <laughs> this, this was uh, uh, Courthouse Lee's territory. His EMPs grabbed me just like that, you know, and, and uh, hauled me off to their, to their little station. And uh, I thought, well, I've done it now. I'm in trouble in Paris. I was not supposed to be in Paris anyway. I was supposed to have gone to the Seventh Army in Alsace, in, in, around Strasbourg somewhere. So um, uh, I thought, you know, this time I got to holler for help. I've, over, I've gotten into deeper water than I can swim out of. So I called up Bob Moura, who was the editor of the Stars and Stripes in Paris. Remember, uh, the Stars and Stripes had many different editions at that time. They had one in Rome, they had one in Paris, they had them in England, they had them here and there. Something like 17 different editions. Moura, I knew, was the, the guy in Paris. So I called him up and explained what was going on with me and the MPs, and he said, I'll come get you out. So he came in short order and got me out. And uh, the next thing that happened was he said, uh, it's interesting that you should be here today, or that you should have arrived here today, because we just got a rocket from Patton today. And this, this rocket said, either you drop those damn cartoons or Patton's going to drop the damn paper out of the Third Army. Well, immediately, of course, the Scribe Hotel was, was abuzz with this, according to Mura. He said, everybody's talking about it. Everybody's wondering how Patton is going to get out of this one. Not how is Malden going to get out of it, but <laughs> <laughs> how is Patton going to get out of it? And he said, he, said, he, just, uh, he just broke that little thing uh, about uh, uh, his using ex-Nazis as, as uh, town officials in all these occupied German villages and hamlets. And uh, his excuse was, that, after all, they were trained civil servants. We needed trained civil servants. They knew their way around. They knew their people. And why the hell shouldn't I use them? They're, they're just politicians. It's like, you know, they're Democrats and Nazis are like Democrats and Republicans. And well, this uh, did not sit too well with a lot of people. <laughs> so Patton, once again, had put his foot into it, and, and uh, Eisenhower's problem was how to keep Patton out of the, you know, public disgrace. So I had a few cards in my hand at this point. <laughs> and uh, uh, it ended up uh, with, a, with a little uh, uh, bar session with, uh, this again is a glimpse back into the Stars and Stripes and the way it operated. We had a circulation manager named Bill Estoff. Bill, uh, when he was drafted at the, in his early 40s, uh, was asked by the classification people what his civilian occupation was, and he said bookmaker. <laughs> he was a bookie in Syracuse. <laughs> so they said, of course, publications. So. <laughs> so he he had been our circulation manager in Rome, and now he was our circulation manager in Paris. Well, Bill Estoff was a good friend of mine, and, and Bill Estoff was also a good friend of Harry Butcher, who was Eisenhower's naval aide, and a very close, you know, associate of Eisenhower. So, uh, a little group gathered, consisting of, uh, of uh, Butcher and uh, 
Estoff and me, and we worked out a way to solve this whole problem. Butcher said, listen, we got to get Patton out of this. He's working for Eisenhower. Butcher is. And uh, we, Estoff, I'm really condensing this several, took a lot of meetings and a lot of booze to get all this done, <laughs> but uh, Estoff uh, said, you got to send Malden to meet Patton. Butcher said, that's brilliant. And Estoff said, what the hell, if it works, great. You know, your problem is solved. If it doesn't work, everybody will get to laughing so hard about it, they'll forget it anyway. <laughs> Which turned out to be the case. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Butcher uh, uh, got me into his office and, and uh, told me that this was the plot and this was going to get everybody out of trouble and so on. And, and I said, that's great, except, you know, he's going to take my head off. And I'm scared of him. I was really very open about that. I, I was afraid to go beard the lion in his den. And uh, Butcher said, uh, it'll be all right. I guarantee you he won't bite you. I'll get him on the phone and show you. And the next thing I know, I'm listening on an extension and Butcher gets Patton on the phone. <laughs> Yeah, Patton's headquarters was in uh, Luxembourg, and of course Patton just came unscrewed when when uh, Butcher made this suggestion to him. Patton just blew, and uh, when he finished squawking, he, he had this very high-pitched voice. That those of you who have not been at war do not realize what those of us who have been at war have done for you with our blood and your money. And when he finished squawking, uh, Butcher said, sir, he didn't, Butcher never said that I was on the extension. He, says, he said, sir, uh, uh, we think it's a good idea. Well, the imperial we was unmistakable. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, Patton knew who Butcher was. He knew him very well. So uh, Butcher said, all right, send a little son of a bitch up. I'll talk to him. <laughs> Butcher said, that's not all, sir. <laughs> he said, you have to greet him like a gentleman, and you have to talk to him like an equal. At least you have to meet him man to man. No rank involved, sir. Now listen, this is a, a Navy captain talking to a three-star Army commander who, who uh, is notorious for being tough. Patton agreed. He said, all right, send him in. I'll talk to him. Okay. So, uh, I won't uh, go into how come I had a Jeep, <laughs> but with, with only a few MP scrapes on the way, I got to Luxembourg, where Patton's headquarters was, and reported to Patton. Patton had a, uh, one of his aides was Major Quirk, and uh, I've never forgotten this guy's name. And I was told that Quirk was the man I should report to. I reported to Quirk. And, and by the way, I was told to be really spick and span, helmet, pistol, you know, washed webbing, everything clean, everything buttoned. And that's how I reported to, uh, to uh, Quirk. Quirk took me into the general's office, and there's this incredible long expanse of uh, carpet leading to this desk. It was the old Mussolini trick, you know, <laughs> make them walk a long way <laughs> so they'll shrivel a little as they come up to you. And so I got up to Patton's desk and snapped a very good salute. And now it got interesting. I mean, and by the way, Patton's dog, Willie, was on a chair right by him, and Willie took an instant dislike to me. <laughs> I, I get along very well with dogs and cats and things like that normally, but uh, Willie, I was immediately a, a threat to him. So he, he uh, lifted his lip at me a little and otherwise uh, withheld his attack. And Patton get, gets up and comes around his desk. And this is when I decided this is going to be all right and offered me his hand. I mean, you know, how conciliatory can you get? He did not return the salute, which would have been a recognition of our military inequity and, and so on. And uh, so anyway, it started off warmly enough at, for about, you know, 30 seconds. <laughs> Patton reverted to type. He, he uh, opened his drawer and 
brought out several clippings of my stuff and uh, wanted to know, for example, uh, uh, I had drawn a, a, um, a picture of a, of a theater somewhere in occupied France or Italy or somewhere, uh, with uh, which advertised showgirls, USO girls. Mainly it was a USO show going on in this building. And I showed uh, a line of enlisted men of all ranks and, and uh, nationalities lined up at the ticket office. And then around the corner is a line of officers hidden in the stage door. And Patton said, uh, what's the meaning of this? And I said, well, sir, uh, it means the enlisted men buy the tickets and the officers get the girls. <laughs> and he said, what the hell is wrong with that? <laughs> At this point, all I could say was rather weakly, you know, well, sir, I just thought it made a funny cartoon. Well, I don't think it's very goddamn funny. <laughs> and it, it, from then on, it was sort of that downhill. But after he, after he went through the cartoons, and by the way, we, by now we were forgetting about that. Uh, I was, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir, no, sir. So much for this equal rank stuff. And oh, and by the way, the other thing was is that, that uh, he had said, Quirk, sit down, I want you to hear this. So Quirk did not leave me with him, as, as had been arranged. Uh, so Quirk was there, too. I'm glad there was a witness to all of this. <laughs> and so any, anyway, uh, uh, we got through the cartoons, and then uh, Patton proceeded to lecture me on what had happened to various armies around the world in the history of the world, uh, where there had been uh, officers had been reduced to, in rank to where they were, you know, equal to enlisted men. They had been stripped of their, of their uh, insignia and so on. And I, I tried to protest several times and say, sir, I'm not trying to, in, you know, promote a democracy in place of an army. I know that, an, uh, you know, an army can't be a democracy, sir. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, uh, uh, the upshot of it was, uh, oh, he, he said, uh, look at the Russians. They, they uh, stripped their officers down to, to made them equal to enlisted men. And look what happened to the Russians. The Germans ate them alive for a long time until finally Stalin got smart and, and uh, began to put rank back on the officers and so on. Well, you know, I wasn't in a position to argue this. And I certainly, and as I again weakly tried to say, sir, I'm not trying to impose democracy upon the army. I know that, that the army needs discipline. Shut up. <laughs> but he didn't say shut up. He just sort of walked over what I was trying to say. And uh, went on, and I was really treated to a, a very learned discussion of armies and their histories. And rank and its history and, and uh, the value of rank and the value of this and that and discipline and so forth. It was about a 45-minute lecture during which I hardly got my mouth open again. And every time I started to open it, he would say something else and I'd shut it. So it was a very much of a one-sided thing, but I wouldn't call it a chewing out. I've been chewed out much more efficiently than he did by a lot of sergeants I've known. So, but uh, he was, he never really got out of line with this. He never really uh, did anything uh, I would call scandalous. He just simply, it was impossible for him to operate by butcher's rules in this case. It was just too much for him. I mean, there was a guy who was very full of himself and full of his rank and so forth. And uh, he's got this little snot nose to deal with and, and he's just doing his best. And he did his best. Uh, the the uh, upshot of it, by the way, there is one little, one little footnote to all this. In Butcher's memoirs, uh, which came out, I think it was my three years with Eisenhower or something like that, Butcher tells this story. And uh, uh, he also says that uh, a good friend of mine named Will Lang, whom I'm sure a lot of you will remember, uh, for time life was sitting outside and he was sort of 
you might call him the pool reporter for this. I mean, the boys in the Scrib had sort of delegated Bill to, to you might call him the pool reporter for this. I mean, the boys in the Scrib had sort of delegated Bill to, to uh, cover this or to cover my reaction when, he, when I came out of Patton's office. So there was Bill waiting for me and he said, well, how did it go? And I said, uh, I guess I didn't convince him of anything. And uh, then I said he didn't convince me of anything either. And uh, Bill reported that. It came out in Time, and uh, Butcher said he called up Patton when this Time magazine thing came out and read it to him over the phone. Patton chuckled when, when uh, you know, the first part of that quote from me. The second part, he absolutely exploded. He said, all right, that does it. If that little son of a bitch ever comes back here, I'm going to nail him. <laughs> that was that. Thank you.